to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 33. Thank you so much for sharing the testimony. I love uh, hearing how God works in different people. And uh, your story is important because you're important to God. And uh, you're here for a purpose even tonight. And uh, let's uh, certainly not miss what God would have for us tonight and throughout this week. As we look towards the, the services this week, definitely make a priority to be here tomorrow. And ask the Lord who you could bring throughout the week that could hear the gospel, especially I would think even on Wednesday night uh, would be a good night to be able to bring someone, but any night would be an excellent night, so I'd encourage you with that. Uh, there are resources back there on the back table that can be a help to you. Everything that comes in from those goes directly to the ministry to spread the gospel. One of the books that are very helpful is called Assurance of Salvation, Dispelling Doubts with the Infallible Truth of God's Word. It's by an evangelist, and he really helps us in understanding um, that once you're saved, you can know that you're saved uh, based upon the Word of God, not upon your feelings, not upon your feel uh, your performance, but you can have that assurance. But in cases like um, with your pastor, there are certain situations you're trying to figure out, am I saved or not? And it really helps us boil down to, if someone is asking that question, do they need assurance, do they need salvation, or do they need revival? If someone is saved, they don't need to get saved again. They need to know for sure that they're saved. So if I'm not sure I'm saved, but you trusted Christ as Savior 10 years ago or whatever, okay, I know I trusted Christ. I need to know now, based upon the, the Bible, these things have I written unto you that believed on the name of the Son of God that ye may know they have eternal life. That's assurance. Well, if someone says, well, I, uh, I was baptized or I did good, um, I'm a good boy, okay, then... You realize, okay, that person needs a salvation. They need to trust Christ and not themselves. But then there's times when um, the believer has sin in their life. The number one thing that causes us to doubt our salvation is sin in our life. And you're like, well, I don't know if I'm going to heaven or not. And if you have trusted Christ to save you, you still have that, that salvation. You need to know for sure, definitely. But now, you don't need to trust Christ to save you again because of your sin. No, as a Christian, you need revival and to confess that sin and draw closer to Him. So a very helpful book in that. I want to encourage you to think about that, maybe leaf through that and look about that. Then also, again, the devotional bundle prayer book. And then also the First Light 365 Devotions, uh, really will help you in your walk with the Lord and drawing closer to Him. Tonight in the passage of Scripture, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 33. Would you stand with me out of respect of God's Word? Exodus chapter 33, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the per Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and the Termites. I'm just making sure you're paying attention. Some of you are lost there. Okay. And uh, verse 3, it says this, Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Now watch this. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. So what God is telling Israel is you can go into the promised land. I'll send an angel that will drive out the enemy, but I am not personally going with you. And later in verse 15, Moses says this. Skip to verse 15. And he said unto him, that is, Moses said unto the Lord, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. In other words, Moses was saying, I don't want the land of promise if your presence is not going to be with me. Amen. The title of the message this evening is A Passion for the Presence of God. A Passion for the Presence of God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would uh, revive us and help us to have a passion for you. Lord, restore to us the joy of our salvation and that deep walk with you, that intimacy. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts. And I ask this in a very clear way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Imagine with me um, that uh, you uh, get a letter, uh, and the letter uh, from um, says this: that uh, you have your all your outstanding bills paid for, any debt that you have for your house, your cars, 
All of it's paid for. In fact, not only that, whatever you're making right now, you're going to be quadrupled in salary. Do I have your attention yet? <laughs> and you have a second house further south where uh, it's a little bit warmer and, uh, and it's fully furnished. You have another vehicle there and it's completely 100% paid for. All of your retirement is taken care of and your nest egg is all set up and ready. Now this sounds way too good to be true, doesn't it? <laughs> and at the bottom of the letter it says, um, is signed, love your heavenly father. <laughs> You're like, wow, God has given me all this, all of these bills paid for, all of this prosperity, in prosperity, South Carolina, and uh, all of these things. And, but then there's a PS. And the letter says this, you can have all these things and all this stuff and all these finances, but you will not know my presence anymore until you get to heaven. Now let me ask, would life be worth living if you didn't have God's presence, His comfort, His peace, His joy, and His help anymore? How many times have we heard movie stars, sports stars, people of fame and fortune committing suicide, being in drugs, alcohol addiction, divorce, and the like, the truth is finances and material gain does not promise that you're going to have peace and fulfillment in your life. We must have a passion for God's presence to be revealed in our lives in a very real way. Now, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And we're going to talk about that more throughout the week. So, in reality, God is always with you. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And He says, now you're the temple of God. But that doesn't mean that you always know or are mindful of His presence and His comfort and His peace and His joy that His presence brings. We must have a passion for God's presence to be revealed in our lives. As we look at Moses, we see that he had this passion. How do we have this passion? First of all, we need to know uh, there's three things that he decided. Uh, Moses did, and we need to decide the same. He decided to go with God's presence. He decided to know his presence. And then as a result, he decided he was going to glow with God's presence. First of all, he decided to go with the presence of God. He decided to go with the presence of God. Now notice uh, what he did not have um, and uh, what he gave up. In verse uh, 1, it says there's a promise. He says, uh, verse 1 of 33, chapter 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, go up hence uh, unto the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, and to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give, give it. This is the promised land. So he said, I'm going to go with God's presence, even though this has been promised. I'd rather have God's presence over his promise. Now, is that pretty important? Yes. Okay. This is the land of Israel. Is there any dirt, any ge geographical location that is more important than Israel? Okay, no, not at all. And here is Moses saying, I'm willing to give that up. If I don't have God's presence, that's what I want most of all. Verse 2, we see him deciding God's presence over his protection. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Hamorite, and all of the enemies. God's protection. We don't need to take for granted God's protection. I tell you, I tell you, um, we pray for safety as we travel. And God's protection is a, it's certainly for him. Safety is from the Lord. It's not uh, from horses or chariots or any strength of our own. It is from the Lord. Uh, more than one time, uh, we've gotten a call. Uh, of someone that's been in an accident. My son, I remember uh, Caleb, uh, he was coming back home from um, uh, college and he was on Spring Bake and uh, he's on a curvy uh, road, uh, no shoulder on it in Tennessee. He said, Dad, I've been in a wreck. And it was just about a half mile or so from um, the Bill Rice Ranch of Tennessee. Man, my heart just dropped into my stomach. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so bad. I, you know, he's like, I'm okay. You know, obviously he's talking to me. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, um, 
you know, come quick. And he had gone in to the, uh, the, the car, had uh, gone off the, the side of the road. There's no shoulder, so the front tire went off. He tried to pull it back over, couldn't. And then the back tire went off. And when he did so, he's in the divot, uh, in the ditch there, and he hit a, like a little uprising. It went airborne, it turned around and it landed breaking that front right tire and it was 180 degree facing the opposite direction. Airbag went off and he was unscathed. Not a scratch. It was God's protection. Uh, one time my daughter was traveling behind us and I saw her and she was trying to change lanes and she came over too soon and she hit uh, a, uh, 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 I think it was a level six uh, truck, not a, not a full size heavy duty, you know, semi seven, uh, but a level six uh, heavy duty truck and it hit her and the car went sideways and pushed her down the road. It had bolt prints uh, from the bumper in the side of the car and they were pushed sideways and I saw this in the rearview mirror <laughs> and I was stopped the car and then it ran back there and we saw God's again protection we don't take for granted that his protection Moses is saying this I'd rather have God's presence over his protection uh, look at um, uh, this his how about his provision in verse 3 unto a land flowing with milk and honey <laughs> Not only uh, milk, but honey. The necessary things of life and the sweet things of life. God's provision. I, I'd rather have God's presence over His promise, protection, His provision, all of these things. And he said, I'm going to be willing to deal with my sin. Look at verse 3. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, God says, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Now, is that a good uh, description? Hey, you know, those people over there, prosperity, they're, you know, well, what, what kind of church are they? Oh, they're stiff-necked. <laughs> That's not a good description, right? You wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that. <laughs> That's talking about being stubborn. God dealing with us. <coughs> and yet, we're stubborn uh, with his dealing. Verse 4 says, And when the people heard these evil tidings, this bad news, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. Now, there were ornaments that they wore, that they got from the other nations. So it'd be like jewelry, maybe a medallion that they'd hang around the neck, maybe earrings, something along those lines. But as soon as you saw the ornament, you knew, oh, that's to the Baal, to the God of Baal or Ashtaroth. It was something to do with idol worship and association, very obvious. And they were wearing this jewelry that was really giving credit or whatever to the idols. Well, look at what happens. Verse 5. For the Lord had said unto Moses, saying to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. You know what? They were willing to deal with their sin. To say, okay, God, what is it that's causing me not to experience your presence. Oh, is it this? Okay, I'm, I'm taking this off. Is it this? I'm stripping this off here. Is it, is it this right here? And they're taking it off, whatever it is. Let me ask, if God says, okay, this is the sin, this is the sinful practice that you're in, and you keep doing this, and this is why you're not experiencing my presence. This is not this is why my presence isn't manifested or revealed to you is because you keep watching this program. It's because you keep uh, neglecting a time of devotions. It's because you keep living selfishly. It's because you don't ever stop and be quiet and be still before God. Whatever it is, if God is going to speak to your heart this week, will you be willing to give up the sin... So you can experience God's revealed promise. He determined, I'm going to go with God's presence. And if I'm not going to have his presence, then I'm not going to go any further. Look at verse 15. Then he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. I'm not going to do it. There's, I'm not going to go any further. Would you have that same, same thing? You know, we could have great... Um, Great services here, um, an exciting message, good songs. We could have uh, a time where we're meeting together. But you know what we really, really need? is for God to show up yes. in His presence. I tell you, there have been meetings, and it doesn't have to be thousands of people. 
or even hundreds of people. But there have been meetings that have been so sweet and so good because we recognize God met with us. And He dealt with our sin. Yes, we had a conviction and we confessed our sin, but that was good. We're clean now. And He dealt with our sin and He dealt with our will. And, and wasn't God just working in our hearts in such a way and people were getting saved? Because God met with us. Would you determine to, to go with God's presence this week? Say, Lord, I'm, along with the evangelists, we want to say, Lord, we don't want to go any further until you, you, you're going to meet with us. Would you meet with us? But not only did he determine to go with God's presence, he determined to know, K-N-O-W, to know God's presence. Look at verse 12. Everybody look at verse 12, chapter 33, verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See that thou sayest uh, unto me, Bring up this people, and thou knowest not that thou hast... Uh, I'm sorry, but bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me, yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou also hast found grace in my sight. Verse 13, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And then, here's God saying to Moses, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Here's Moses, okay. All he knows so far is that God has called him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. He went to, I said, okay, who should I said that it's going to send me? I am. God tells Moses. And God delivers uh, through Moses and Aaron and the wonderful things with the rod and the miracles and the plagues. And God leads them out. But Moses doesn't really know God like you would think. He says, I, I want to know you. And I want to I know your presence. I don't know who you, who you are. You know, what we need to do is we need to determine to know God's presence. Now, this isn't just a one-time thing or once a year we meet with God and know His presence. We need to know God's presence on a regular basis. He asks, Dear God, would you show me your glory in verse 18? It's amazing. God said, I will, um, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I'll come and I'll, I'll uh, you can't see my face, but I'll let my goodness pass before you and I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and, and I'll put my hand over your face and I'll let you just see my backside, but not my face because you can't, you can't experience my face and live. That's how glorious God is. That's how white, uh, white and bright and light God is. God is absolutely amazing. And we see... God calling Moses to meet with him on a regular basis. But there are some practical th things starting in chapter 34 that I believe we can implement to know God's presence like we ought to on a regular basis. Would you write these words down uh, in chapter 34? If I'm going to know God's presence, first of all, write the word down, preparation. Preparation. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and be ready in the morning. And come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me at the top of the mountain. Okay, so he said, be prepared. Be ready. Okay, what's supposed to be ready? Okay, I want you to bring two tables of stone. Why? Because God is going to give you something. God is going to give you a word. Okay, he's going to give them the Ten Commandments. He's going to give them those things, okay, and the law. Uh, and God said, that's even glorious uh, in the New Testament. So God's going to give you something. Let me ask, do you take a, a pen and paper, do you have a notebook when you have your devotions? Or you just read? You are not going to remember what you read. Okay, let me ask, what did you have for devotions seven days ago? It's kind of like asking, what did you have for breakfast seven days ago? Unless you eat the same thing every day. <laughs> You're not going to remember. Okay, well, what, what, how, what did you have for devotions? What did you learn four days ago? Okay, uh, Bill Rice the second said this, a short pencil is better than a long memory. <laughs> You're not going to remember. You know what? 
if you could just do one thing that could radically change what you learn from God every day is this. I'm going to write down one verse or one truth that God speaks to my heart about. Just write that one thing down. And I wouldn't do it on a loose piece of paper. You're going to lose it. But uh, have some type of journal, some type of type of deal where you're writing it down either digitally or whatever, but I would encourage your paper on a notebook. And, and this is my one verse. And I'm looking... Do you, do you know that God is wanting to speak to us every single day? <laughs> and God is. It's just we're not listening. And how are you going to memorize that or remember what God is speaking in your heart? Be prepared saying, okay, I'm going to come with a pen and paper and I'm ready. God, why are you going to speak to my heart? And he said, be ready in the morning. So I need to prepare a time. Uh, some would say I do my devotions at night, but for me, I have to do it in the morning. I have to do it in the morning. I want to do it to start my day. I want to prepare and say, okay, I'm going to plan to get up. Some of you, uh, you have to drive to get to work, or some of you have something in the morning. Well, then whatever that, that time you have to leave, then you have to get up so much earlier before that, so I'm going to spend this much time with the Lord, and I encourage you to do so. But be prepared with a time, a place... And paper to be able to write down what God would have. That's just at least a basic sense to be prepared. Number next is this. Not only write down the word preparation, write down the word isolation. Isolation. Verse 3. And the Bible says this, And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds be feed before that mount. So God wanted to meet with Moses alone, isolated. And that's something. Do you know that God wants to meet with you? No man should come up with you. you. We must get alone with God. And in that time, be still and know that, that He is God. During that time, you can pray out loud. You know, if someone's in the room, you can't always do that, right? But pray out loud. You can pour out your heart. You can say things to God. You can't say to anybody else. You can pour out your heart to God. Do you, do you have a time when you do that? Get alone with God. God wants to meet with you. Um, there was a, <clears throat> uh, it was actually a Southern Baptist pastor years ago in the 1980s, and uh, <clears throat> he, along with several other clergy, hundreds of clergy, uh, were asked to come to Washington, D.C. for a time of prayer and time of things for, uh, to get together with the President of the United States. The President at that meeting came to this pastor and said, Hey, I am flying tomorrow to your city. And i like for you to fly with me on Air Force One. Would you do so? And I have some questions I'd like to ask. And we could meet there, and we could land in your city, and we could arrange for a ride to get back to your church. Well, what did the pastor say? Ah, uh, let me think about it. You know who was president? It was President Ronald Reagan. And <clears throat> the president said, yes, sir, that would be fantastic. Okay, so that, pres that pastor, though, was flying in and out the same day. He canceled the flight out. Why? Because he's going to meet with the president. He didn't have a hotel room, and so he booked a hotel room. Why? Because he's going to meet with the president of the United States. He didn't have a change of clothes. He went and bought one. Why? Because he's going to meet with the President of the United States. He had to get his toiletry items and everything to be able to groom himself and clean and everything. He did all of that and got it. Why? Because, because the President wanted to meet with him. Folks, the God of the universe <laughs> loves you. And he wants to meet with you individually. <laughs> Do you not have the time? Do you not see it as a priority? What, what can you not rearrange in your schedule? Folks, God Almighty loves you and He wants to meet with you. The whole point of revival is to draw your heart closer to God in an intimate relationship with Him. Isolation. If we're going to meet with God, we need to have preparation, isolation. How about expectation? Um, he was expecting God to, to work and, and to give him something in chapter 4, uh, chapter 34, verse 4. And he hewed two tables of stone like in the first and rose up in the morning and expected God to give him something. 
We need to continue on and look, if you would, down in uh, chapter uh, 34 and verse 6. It says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and, and gracious. Write down this word, revelation. God is revealing himself, revelation. He says, The Lord, uh, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Verse 7, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that by will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. What is, is God doing? God is revealing Himself through His Word. How do we know God? Know His Word. God reveals Himself. Well, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to be quiet and I'm going to meditate. That's good. We do need to do so. But meditation isn't just blank up there, not thinking about anything, emptying ourselves of any thought or whatever. No, no, no. God wants us to think of His Word and to know His Word. And when we know His Word, we know Him. God is going to reveal, look at all those things. He's long-suffering, merciful, gracious, abundant in goodness and truth. <laughs> you have an you incredible Heavenly Father. And, and, and he wants to, you to know him in a greater way. But then, in verse 8, we see uh, 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 this, this worship and to the Lord. In verse 8, And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward heaven, uh, toward the earth, and worshipped. He said, Okay, God, um, I'm, I'm worshipping you and who you are. You know, there's a time where we need to really uh, worship God. <clears throat> I st started, I don't know how many years ago now, a time of worship in my devotional time, my time with God. And at first, can I just be honest, I thought it was going to be like laborious. It was going to be oh, just like a routine. And um, so I have a list of the names of God and the attributes of God, and I just go one name or one attribute for each day. And I look up that passage or multiple passages about that name or that attribute and just have a time of worship. And I tell you that immediately, immediately puts me in the right mindset for devotions. I start with worship first. And then immediately after that, you know what? I'm just still and quiet, thinking about that, worshiping the Lord. You know what I do next? <laughs> I start to see my sin. I have a confession time, not first. It's after I worship God and see how holy, how high, how wonderful, long-suffering, gracious, merciful, good, uh, all of these things that God is. And then there's the time of confession. Now, more confession may t take place later as God's revealing more of His Word. But there's that confession time and, and certainly asking the Lord for forgiveness and help later on. But I encourage you, would you say, Dear God, help me to know you in this way. Would you say, Lord, I've been missing something from my personal time. Maybe you don't even have devotions. Would you say, God... Help me to know you and have a time. You can call it devotions, your time with God, whatever it is, but a time where you're in His Word and praying, but you need a plan. You need some help. A devotional would help you. Uh, um, a plan actually organized. I'm writing down a verse. I'm, I'm having something scheduled. I'm having this preparation and isolation and God's revelation to me and, and this observation and worship and all of these things that God is, speaks in my heart about. And you can have a list uh, of attributes of God, whatever, but have a plan with that. Say, God, there's something that's been missing. Let me ask, has, has your devotions been vibrant? Are they alive? Or are they kind of dead and dry? If it were um, illustrated by a breakfast, would it be a, a big breakfast? Like a Cracker Barrel, you know. The Uncle Herschel's is what they, I used to get. I don't know if they still have that one or not, you know. It's like biscuits and gravy and three eggs, not two. And uh, meat. And you got that country ham that'll clog your arteries. And uh, you got grits and hash browns. I mean, it's just packed, you know. It's huge breakfast. Or is your breakfast dry toast? That's 
burnt on one side <laughs> and no butter <laughs> and water. You know, uh, that's, that's not a good breakfast right there. Let me ask, is that the type of devotions you're having? You know, folks, it's not something that's missing. It's someone. And having God reveal himself in a more intimate way. We see that he determined, I'm going to go with God's presence. I'm going to know God's presence. Then as a result, he had a glow from God's presence. He, he had a glow from God's presence. Look at chapter 34 all the way down to verse 29. Chapter 34 verse 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers and congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them uh, commandment, all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. So what's going on? Moses met with God, and he didn't realize this, but the God's glory was being revealed to him in a very intimate way where his face was radiant. He was shining. He was glowing. <laughs> his face shone. So he came to me with them, and they're like, whoa, your face is shining. <laughs> And, and, and Aaron's afraid, and the children of Israel are afraid. They're not coming near him, so they're backing away. And so he's coming to talk to them, and they, could, they wouldn't even listen to the message. They're afraid because he's shining. And so to be able to deal with that, he put a veil, a covering, uh, over his face. I don't know how much you could see out, but at least it, 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 it made it where they weren't afraid, and they wouldn't see the, the glowing, if you will. And so he would speak to the people. And then, after that, he would go to meet with God again. Look at verse 34. And when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil, what? Off. Until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel uh, that which it was commanded. And the children of Israel saw that the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So he went in with God, met with God. He took the veil off. Why? Because there is no veil before God. There is no hiding. There is no covering. God sees you fully. Who you are. Who you really are. What you're really like. God knows you. And then he would come out and speak to the people. Oh, put the veil on. He would now speak to the people. And this was repeated. He would go back in, take off the veil, speak with God. And he would come back out and speak again. And God met with him and he met with God in such a way that it was obvious to others. Is it obvious to others that you're meeting with God? That you're walking with God? And so many times I have to say, we let those things slide. And the reality is we don't spend the time in God's presence and walking with Him. And instead of a glow, instead of a radiance, instead of shining, there's a, rather a dullness. You know, if, if you took... Um, a poker for a fireplace, a metal poker, and you adjusted the logs of a fire and stirred up the fire a little bit and just poked around a little bit, that cold metal poker wouldn't get real warm if you moved a couple logs and just took it out right away. But if you take that metal poker and you place it in the heart of the fire and you leave it there for 10 minutes, 20, 30, 45 minutes, and you take some gloves and you take, carry it out carefully and you have it red hot or maybe orange you take it out of the fire and man don't care, don't touch it it's too hot and you set it out on the bricks or on the mantle or whatever and you see this what's going to happen as soon as you take it out that red or that orange is going to start to fade the glow it's going to start to fade because you take it out when it's in the fire the poker's in the fire and the fire is in the poker 
But when you take it out, the glow immediately begins to fade. You know, I wonder, have you not been meeting with God and the glow's faded? Have you not had God's revealed presence in your lives and there's something missing? (laughs) Folks, again, it's not something. It's someone. And there's the glow that's faded. You know, in chapter 35, chapter 36, I kept reading to see if the veil is mentioned anymore, but it isn't. Somewhere along the line, Moses stopped wearing the veil because his face stopped shining. Because he stopped meeting with God. I wonder, this is just humanly speaking, it never says this, but I wonder if after he stopped meeting with God and there's no shine, did he ever get tempted to wear the veil over his face, not to hide the fact that he was shining, but to hide the fact that the glow faded. It was gone. Let me ask, has that glow faded? As you say, you know, my, my heart's not on fire for God. I don't know God like I ought to. I need revival. I need God to rekindle that in His meeting with Him. Would you say, dear God, tonight, I need to, I'm going to go with your presence. I'm going to give up anything. Sinful practice, whatever it is, I'll confess it. I want to go with you. I want to know you in your presence. Lord, help me tonight to glow with you in your radiance. Would you determine to have a passion for God's presence? Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would work in our hearts, help us have a passion for your presence in a very obvious and a definite way. Lord, right now, speak to our hearts and help us to be open to you and to your word. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, just in the quietness, right here. Say, Brother Miller, God has spoken to my heart. And as a result of God speaking to my heart, I realize that in my own heart, I haven't been meeting with God like I ought to. The glow's faded. I need to meet with God. I, I want to have a, I need a passion for God's presence. God has spoken to me about having a passion for God's presence in my life to be revealed to me. If that's true for you, all throughout the room, would you raise your hand nice and high? Say, that's me. God bless you. Good. Wonderful. Others, did God speak to you about having a passion for God's presence? Anyone else? You say, that's me as well. God's spoken to me. Okay, let me ask next. Who here would say, Brother Miller, the glow's just faded. I see there's something missing. Uh, I need revival. God's just, He's speaking to my heart. There's something missing. I know that I do need revival. I don't know how to fully come back or what I need, but I just need to be revived. I know that. If that's true for you, can you slip your hand up? Say, that's me. Just slip your hand up high enough where I could see it and you can place it down. Let me ask finally, who here would say, there's one thing I do know for sure. I know that I am saved. If you know you're saved because you've trusted Christ as Savior, can you raise your hand and say, I know that. I know that most importantly. God bless you. You can place your hands down. Would you look this way? Everyone look right here. In just a second, God spoke in a heart about having a passion for His presence to be revealed in our lives. Let's just spend some time with the Lord. We're going to stand. I'll pray. After we pray, we'll have the pianist play. God spoke in your heart. Would you pray about that thing that God spoke in you? Let's stand for prayer. Father, I ask for your blessings right now. Please, Lord, work in our hearts and help us right now. Revive us, Lord, I ask, in a very obvious way. Lord, I pray you'd help with each of these in whose heart you're working. With their heads bowed, with their eyes closed, God, why don't you take some time to respond to him as the pianist plays.
glad you looked this way. I'm very thankful for the message, and you know if uh, it applies to you or not, you know, we're only as close to God as we want to be, and that's just the fact of the matter is. And it's only the closer we draw to God, the closer that He can do what He wants to do in our lives where we're moldable and pliable. Um, it's one thing to do your devotions, read through something like I did when I first got saved, reading through uh, my utmost to His highest, and you see what somebody else has written. It's another thing to put how God's spoken to your heart in there. I encourage you, uh, I have it on my bookshelf, uh, First Light, one of the devotions uh, Brother Bill Rice has written. And uh, if you need a devotion, something to help you, uh, please get that. Uh, you know, we need God more than we need anything else. There's no better time that you can spend than time you spend with God. So thank you for that, Brother Miller. And uh, Brother Ed, would you mind closing us out in a word of prayer? Set aside. Your word is there for us. So help me personally, Father, as well. Help continue to grow in my time. Help me to be uh, closer to you, Lord. Uh, when you lay its way upon me, Father, I just pray that uh, I can just learn more and more to set those things aside. So again, I just thank you for this precious time. I thank you for those that are here. Continue to bless these services. I pray for the work that you've done before. I pray for the work that you've done right now and the work that you will do in all of these lives here, Lord. I just thank you so much for this time. We love you. We ask all of this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. 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 Be inviting people out, please. God is good.